I think we're going to start filming right now. My name is Penny Wright. We're so happy to have all of you here. And we're very delighted and grateful to have two guests, two travelers here. We've been here before to the library. And they are Jeanette Downs and Ellen Viallo. I'll start with Jeanette. Where is Jeanette? Oh, there you are. Jeanette. <laughs> Jeanette is the director of instructional technology for the Wayne Scott School District and the robotics teacher for the Sagaponic School. In addition, as a consultant, she provides professional development services to schools to support the effective integration of technology-based instructional tools. Over the past 30 years, she's traveled the country and the world and has lived in San Diego, Santa Barbara, Manhattan, and now in Hampton Bays. She has spent summers in Corsica, taught special education teachers in Bhutan, toured the schools of Cuba, Vietnam, and Namibia. She's thrilled to be here tonight to share her experiences with you. So please welcome Jeanette Down. And with Jeanette is Ellen Piallo, who's standing over here. Um, Ellen is CEO, president, and founder of Interactive uh, educational Systems Design, IESD, which is an educational market and product development research company recognized in K-20 through publishing as a teacher in research and analysis. She founded the DOLS, Dirty Old Ladies of Software, a professional women's organization that helps women who work with business, the business of education to help one another. She received her graduate degree in educational psychology from Teachers College at Columbia University. She lives in Hampton Bays and still spends some time in the city. And travel has always been an important part of her life, for which we are grateful. So please welcome Ellen Biello. So we're going to hand this over to them. They're going to use this So someone asked when we first started, excuse me, someone just started by asking, what was your budget? No budget. Oh. When you're on vacation, no budget. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you for all being here. I understand it's raining now as well, so good. Anyway, um, so we went to Namibia in last February. Uh, we were there for two weeks. We had a wonderful time, and we're happy to share it with you. So uh, some of you might have already looked at the handouts, but don't look right now because I have a question for you. Take a guess, or maybe some of you know, how many countries are in Africa? 30? 30. 33? 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. 30. Anybody else? 50? 50. 50. Other guesses. There's a prize. 54. Oh. 54. You're not included 54. in this. Am I right? <laughs> yes, 54. Oh, All right, but you said 50, so you get Yay! one. I love Why should I, I be disqualified? Come on up and get your prize. <gasps> Two African candies. So there are 54 countries in Africa. It's really hard to believe. Namibia. Uh, you actually have a handout of Africa, which you might want to look at now, so you can see all the countries. And you can see that Namibia is located in Africa, kind of where California is located in the U.S. Jeanette's going to point. So you see, Namibia has a lot of coastline, about the same amount of coastline as California, even a little bit more. Um, it's. Uh, a new country, it's, new, it's independent since the early 90s. It was a Dutch colony, then it was a German colony, then it was uh, ruled by South Africa and became independent in, 19, I think, 1994. So it's a really interesting place to visit. The people are warm, wonderful, tour, tourism is their main industry, uh, and it's actually growing. So if you're thinking about going to Africa, it maybe is a great place to go now because it's getting more expensive uh, as opposed to Botswana, South Africa, some of the other countries out of there. Um, you also have a map of Namibia. And Jeanette's going to talk about exactly where we went and we're going to show you pictures of animals, uh, of our guides, of some of the activities we've participated in and hopefully share with you what a great trip we had. 
Okay, they're also um, very eager to bring people to live in Namibia. It's a very inexpensive place if you'd like to change your citizenship. Um, it, the cost is look like around two hundred thousand dollars, but you get a home with that and some acreage. So if you're in the mood for a new country, <laughs> Namibia is looking for you. <laughs> okay, so we traveled almost the whole whole length of Namibia. We started around the middle in Vintuk, um, which was a little. Uh, I kind of a little town. It was their big town, right? <laughs> it took, yes, I believe it is their capital. Yes, we saw it. Um, two grocery store, you know, very small town. Then uh, we stayed there in a lovely hotel. Um, just to get step back for a second. Um, we'll go all the list. I think we have a map for you to look at of all the places we went in took. Okay, so we start off, most important part of the flight, I always tell people of a trip, you gotta go business class. If you don't go business class, you're gonna be cranky. You probably will have to go find a chiropractor right away, your little back's gonna hurt, it's gonna be very, very bad. It's a very long flight. 14 hours or something like that. So business class... Well, 14 and then an additional 11, I think, or Yeah, right. Well, we, we went to London, right. and then London to Joburg, Johannesburg, right, and then Johannesburg. But when we came back, we went another way. Yeah, when we came back, we went through Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Oh, really? So, with a simple business class, you lie down. That's all that matters, right? Oh, yeah. So they have lie down flat. <laughs> okay, our first meal. We stopped at a little cafe. A uh, little sense of what the menu is there. We don't, I don't think people would go there for the food. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was Germanish. So if you're like really into like Germanish food, you know, more like meats. They're cooked with a brown sauce. Kudu, right? Kudu and zebra, but that's not the bad part. I thought that was pretty good. I was the one who ate everyone there. If we saw them, I ate them. Zebra? Uh huh. I ate zebra. I ate kudu. What else is on there? Why eat ham? I could eat that at home. Why eat chicken? I could eat that at home. We didn't see many chicken there. Hmm. I don't know what the other stuff is. Well, I'll point out everyone I ate along the way. I didn't eat this. Whoa. But nobody offered it to me either. What is it? It's worms, dried worms. Oh, yeah. So they lot the markets had a lot of this kind of thing, because you know there's not there's no agriculture. Everything they're getting they're going to get from South Africa, whether it be fruits and vegetables. Um, the meat comes from the center of the country, where the Dutch set up the big ranches. And they still are the ranches. And part of the apartheid in opening up Namibia was to set up public grazing areas where people could go for and bring their goats mostly, or cows, mostly goats, um, where they could graze and they could stay for years and then move on to another public grazing area because there was really no place that the people of the country could go to do their work. Everything had been pretty locked up by the um, colonialists, I guess, yeah, and those people. So, we got a lovely dried fish, so we didn't really eat much. Okay, so now that, let's get back quickly to the no budget. <clears throat> All right, so yes, we were at um, camps, bush camps. Could you sleep in that bush camp? Yeah. Isn't that lovely? It was so soft. And when you got in bed, they put a um, hot water bottle, which is really scary because they don't tell you. <laughs> and you get in, and there's this warm thing, and your foot's getting closer and closer to this warm thing, and you're thinking, should I touch it? <laughs> it's called a bush baby. Oh. And, and yes, they had, had people who beat the bush baby to death. And then they had to take the bed out because it was all wet, but, but I didn't do that. And if you see next to it, that was another sitting area that we had where we could just sit out and look at a lot of um, warthogs, mostly, coming up and 
this close. Let's show you. They were right here. So this is our room, and then there was a little tiny walkway, and there was a second, um, I don't know what you would call it, almost like, like a gazebo. You know, cabanas, you and know, open there space. there was food, you know, and to feed the animals. To the animal, and it overlooked this uh, water hole, which we'll show you some yeah. pictures of now. Yeah, overlooked the water hole. What time of year was this? Uh, we went, uh, I think it was, it was July. Over there for July. Which is their winter. So no bugs. No bugs at all. So really we didn't have to get the shots and things. Why is there no farming? It's desert. It's arid. Oh, it's land. Yeah, the land. Yeah. I don't think we saw, I mean, we rarely saw something growing that was green here. Very rare. You'll see the, the trees. <laughs> okay, this is one. Um, you get a sense of the people. You don't see it very well. Pasadena, we have chickpea with polenta and lime. So, so, corn oils. Let's go. We have a big dinner. I can play the hula. See that you always get covered by the money of the donkey. See that you need the money of the donkey. You must go out to the market. So, who don't who don't know what that is? Okay, so you get a sense not just of the the people who are really everywhere we went. They, they would start with a song, you know, "Welcome to Rhino Camp." I can sing, you know, it's really fun. And you always jumped up and sang. But they were also teaching us the language and the culture. Um, so at our meals at one of the camps, they tell us what was to eat, and then someone would translate it in the quick language, which is the language of the Herrera people, which is one of the big tribes in Namibia. Um, want to talk about the Herreras a little bit? <coughs> so the Herrera people were actually um, really attacked and demeaned by the colonialists, but they're making a comeback now and they've actually regained some of their lands. So you can think about Native Americans here and what, what's gone on. Uh, so the Herrera have a, a huge heritage, and there are actually, I think, two or three different click languages. It depends on the number of clicks in the language, and they go, whatever. But they integrate it into their speech. So as Jeanette said, they would come and read the menu to us, someone would translate it into click. And it was just fascinating, because they grow up doing this. You know, they learn it when they're babies, as they learn to speak. So we'll have another example of uh, one of the schools we visited where the teacher actually is teaching the clicks to the students. Okay, so this was um, the, one of the first places we stayed was called Okanjima, and uh, these are just some of the animals in the area. That's a warthog. We've got a couple of close-ups of war. There's another warthog. Now that's a close-up. Now that was looking out on that little gazebo we had. It was like right below us. It was incredible. I mean, they're really ugly, but they're kind of cute in a certain way. Um, Do they eat them? Yes. Jeanette ate everyone, as she said. Jeanette had warthog, zebra, kudu, whatever. I had none of the above. Are they, are they all caught wild or are they farmed? They're farmed. Right. They're not like... Zebra too? Yep. They're farmed. Just the way we farm cows and things like that here. You know, you only eat farm animals. So. No, they don't really do it that way. They actually have areas where they have the animals and they allow people to go out and hunt. So they're, they're, that's a job, hunting, and they hunt for the animals that then they use in all the places. It's not farming like they do the cows, like the regular way, that horrifying. They live in house places. Yeah, I'll talk to her more first. <laughs> She's the one who told me how horrifying it is. <laughs> okay. So this is Jeanette sitting on the edge looking uh, down at a warthog. Okay, some more war. Oh, and that's a guinea fowl. They run around everywhere there. You'll see more photos of them as well. And again, this is a view from the lodge itself where we went and had our meals. So all the meals were part of the trip. In fact, one of the handouts that we gave you is the actual uh, travel agenda so you can see where we went. 
Uh, so this, you looked out where we had our meals and there was a water hole. And the, you know, water, of course, always attracts the animals. So we always saw animals right out there. And every, every place you went had a, had a water hole visible from where you ate. Sometimes it was way up high, sometimes it's right on ground level. But so you, it was a constant show of who was going to come visit each day. And that is. <coughs> so we went to the, a place called the Africa Foundation, which is a conservation um, place. And they have some old animals there. There's some breeding that goes on there, just some that are orphaned. So they have mostly leopards and cheetahs. So there are a bunch of pictures here, and you, we, these are all taken with an iPhone, so you can see how close we were. I mean, you can't do a lot of zooming. I mean, they were right there. We were not walking for the most part. We were in a, a vehicle. So there were, I think, 10 of us on the trip, something like that. So we were split in two vehicles, kind of Jeep-like vehicles, where the tops came up, you know, when we stopped sometimes for viewing. But mostly we were in these vehicles, and you were really close to the animals. That's a, um, what do you call it? A hill of what type of shoes? Oh, uh, termite? termite hill. Yeah, there were termite good. hills everywhere. They were huge. Is that a I, I don't know how old it was, but it's a leopard, yeah. yeah. That's right, during the day. Yeah, mostly what we saw during the day were <coughs> cheetahs, yeah. But I, I should also talk just a little bit about the birds. Um, I started keeping track of the birds. I had a list of about 57 birds that we saw. It's hard to take photos of those with the iPhone, but this is, this, no, this is a Montero's hornbill. You know, I mean, the birds there were a few we had that we have here, but mostly they were unique to, uh, to Africa. All right, so part of the trip is they have something called sundowners just about every day, right? Everybody know what a sundowner is? Yeah. And um, so at the end of the day, what is it? they would take us for a drive around sunset, and they have a full bar set up. Sometimes they have it set up before we got there. So you're in the middle of nowhere, basically, and here we are around the, the, uh, the Jeep, you know, and they would make drinks for us, wine, beer, whatever you wanted to have, and we'd watch the sunset. Then we go back to our bush camp, you know, relax a little bit before dinner, take a nap maybe, and, uh, and then have dinner. So you'll see a number of pictures throughout the presentation where we're having our sundowners. A few sunset pictures here. <coughs> it was incredibly beautiful. Oh, I should just say something about that last one. It's a, it's a picture of the fence. And what they do is they build fences, not the way we do, but they take uh, f fallen trees and they harvest them and they cut them in a particular way and they dig them into the ground and attach them together. And this is just a close-up of the fence. And I, I think you'll see some more of those. You can imagine it's like nothing. So you'll drive, for, oh, you'll drive for miles and miles and miles. And if it's not those fences that are all together, it's wire fences with pieces of wood stuck in between for some reason. I don't know why. I was sick of asking stupid questions like that. Are, are you driving on just dirt? Dirt path? roads, yeah. We have some pictures of the roads um, further along, but nothing's paved. Um, you get into town, they're paved. But if it's hard, it's kind of paved for them. And, and, if, and, if, they, and if there was a layer of gravel, that was pretty high end. Because it wasn't really like that. 
and then they made up this song and sang for a very long time <laughs> to this person. They were just so sweet and so personable. And it wasn't, it was the combination of those, this piece, but also their incredible knowledge of their surroundings and the animals and the birds <coughs> that we've already seen. <coughs> So this is another leopard. Oh, wait. Cheetah. It's a cheetah. How do we know it's a cheetah? Okay, does anybody know how you can tell the difference between a leopard and a cheetah? From that picture, and that picture is helpful. Is that the cry line? Yeah. The you got it. It's those cry lines. That is. Right? Cheetahs always have that. They also have different kinds of spots. You know, one has spots and the other is a little more random shape. And it's got like a brown background, so you might see black with tan in the middle. Um, and that's really different. Yeah, much they're growing, something that you'd find growing. That looks like it's not growing very much, but it is. How often do they get rain? Yeah, not much. Once a year, maybe? Then at night, we, in each of the places we went, there was a, a blind, is that what they called it? Where you'd go at night um, and look out. Sometimes they'd put food out for them, sometimes they didn't. And you just sit and watch and wait for animals to come. I, I think it's a kind of hyena. Uh, yes, we think so. We tried to figure it out before we got here, but we didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the animal, when you looked at it the other way, it was all shoulders. Every All its muscle was up here. Um, and very small back legs. There's a question here. Yes. So now, was this done through a travel group, or did you guys organize this on your own? We have a friend who has a small travel agency, and she takes people on tours. Um, she, we went with her to Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, usually, the small trips would be ten people, um, and she goes basically as part of the group, um, and. The, the way it works is that we pay for her trip, um, and that's the way she runs her business. And yeah. I was going to say, she, the nice thing about it is she works with small local tour operators. So she really kind of gets into the weeds with them and figures out where to go and where she wants to be and how she wants to run the tour. So while it doesn't, as, as Jeanette said, it, it does pay for her trip, not the whole thing. It kind of defrays part of her cost, and she's happy with that. We're happy with it, too. Yeah. How many uh, support staff on the, tri the trip? You know, you look like there were quite a few people who were... Well, we had two guides, because um, we needed two trucks um, for our ten people. So everyone has to have a window. And they were... When we went to the camps, then we would get a guide for each of the, the preserves. And I think that's pretty standard, because they know what's going on there. So basically, it was the two guides who led the whole trip from beginning to end, picked us up from the airport, and dropped us off back when we were finished. So it wasn't always your group alone at the preserves, or did you mix with other groups? There were some other groups, but they were all very, very small. So if there were others, it was, you know, we were 10, maybe there were 10 more other people at the preserve where we went. Never more than that. Were they all Americans? No, none. No Americans, really. No, no. I think we were I don't the only so. Americans. Yeah, a lot of Europeans. People from um, from Vento, people from South Africa. You know, it's 
a cool thing to do, I guess, even if you live in the country, yeah, in the I mean, nation or in the continent. Right. With everything being um, as small as a small town, how readily accessible was the community? They were very accessible. Um, never had a problem stopping for gas at the place. There was just like a, 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 here, yeah. gas station with milk and eggs and beer and whiskey and whatever. I would just add that they knew where the stations were, yeah. so they they knew where to go. But I did have a real exciting thing happen while I was there. We were at, stopped at a place. And I was really like on chocolate, you know, withdrawal, and I actually found a jar of Nutella that I bought. So it was a real highlight for me. And then she meted it out, you know. We had to really work for it. <laughs> Did you ever go off out alone, out away from the group, on your own? There was no place to go. When we were in Bitco, we went to where we wanted to go. But once you got out of there, you'd been eaten by an animal. You're in, you're in a safari. But when you were in the, when you were in the. We were only in really one, yeah, only really one city. And yes, we went off on our own. No problem, very safe. <coughs> you know, it was small. I mean, that's where we started and we left. It's a capital. But otherwise, right. we were in the bush. And See, there's nowhere to go. Right. And if you did go someplace outside, you could have been eaten. <laughs> Though there was only one place where you had to wait for someone to come who was had a gun to walk you to dinner and breakfast and those things. Only one camp. Otherwise, I guess there were no people eating animals in the immediate area of the camps. Well, that after dark. Before dark. That was the guinea fowl. These are more warthog war war pictures. We got a little obsessed with the warthogs. They're kind of cute. So that was the water hole right behind the room. And that's the fence. Right. Yeah, the better view of the fence. And then um, we learned when we were there, there are several kinds of antelope, which you may or may not know. There is something called a dick dick, which is D-I-K, D-I-K, little tiny one. Then there's springbok. Spring Those are the things that do what they call pronking. You know, they jump off the ground completely off. And that was really fabulous. Straight up. Right, to see, see a whole herd of them running. And then there were impalas and elans and uh, kudus and... All, all kinds of animals. This is a this is a, a gemsbok, G E M S B O K, and that was right by our lodge. Okay, these are that's a cheetah, and right there's a whole series of wonderful cheetah pictures here. Did you ever see them running? Yes, yeah. we saw babies, a pair of set of twins. Oh. That was so cute. They ran under. We were stopped and watching them because they don't. The guides know them, and they say, well, we haven't seen this one in two weeks, or we haven't seen that one, you know, we've been looking for them. And they hadn't seen the, the twins in a month. And so all of a sudden, outrun, the, mo the mother comes and outrun the tw twins, and they're playing, and all of a sudden, one goes underneath the front van and pops out in right in front of us. We were stationary. Um, and then, we don't know what happened, but immediately the two cubs went back with the mother, the mother took them out of sight, and then they came back and he didn't go into the van again. <laughs> and I saw a little paw print on his head. <laughs> but we don't know what happened. You know, I'm, I'm an editorial yeah. reporter, I didn't want to see that. <laughs> but you know, you make up the stories. <laughs> we could have been a little show in our van. <laughs> oh. That is so close. You, you have a temptation of touching that belly. <laughs> But you know, because they talk about somebody who like just rolls down the window and sticks the camera out, and the thing's like, oh, yeah. just like yeah. that. <laughs> you know, they talk, I don't know if it's true, but I didn't want to find out. Yeah. We never saw anybody really running around. Like, we didn't see anyone hunting or anything like that, which I was fine with. The porcupine. Yeah, sometimes they took us out on a night drive if you wanted to go. And it got very cold at night. So one night, the three of us went, Jeanette and I and one other friend, and one of the guys took us out. And we saw this porcupine, and there were some jackals. Mm -hmm. And 
the background, it was really incredible. And that's when we saw a really old leopard late at night just walking along. Yeah. And there's a porcupine quill that we collected oh, yes. over By there. By the way, we have some uh, things over there on the table. Feel free to take a look at them. They're not going to be take home. But so those are some of the things that we uh, brought back with us. So take a look at them. These are antelope, right? Uh, My checker. Uh, zebra, there are two kinds, mmm, that was yummy. Um, actually, it wasn't gamey either. It wasn't like, so if you go, don't be afraid. <laughs> You're not going back. Yeah, go for it. So, there are two kinds of zebra. There are plains zebra, P-L-A-I-N-S, and mountain zebra. <laughs> plains zebra are the most common. They have stripes all the way down under their bellies. And the mountain zebra have a white belly. The stripe doesn't go completely around. So these are, let's see. So this is mountain. Right. Uh, well, that's what they're called, though. Okay, we'll just scoot through some of these slides, given the time constraint, so you can see some of the animals. Yeah. Ostrich, right? That's the back of the ostrich. Eating ostrich? A lot of ostrich. Did he eat any other eggs? Did you try ostrich? I didn't eat the eggs. I've done that in the United States, but I did. Yeah. Yeah, so it was a kind of a waste there. I'd already yeah. done that. <laughs> uh, I was going to say with the ostrich, they have an incredible number of babies. I don't know if you can see in that previous slide. I don't think it came up yet. Oh, I don't know. Sure. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, it was. But when they have babies, there are like hundreds of them yeah. running around on the floor, and they're little. Mm -hmm. so they they must have really, really boring. Mm -hmm. And now we're starting to get into our giraffes. Our guys. The, the man on the left, his family was in the um, ranching business. And they're like the enemies of the people who are trying to preserve, obviously. Um, so it's kind of an interesting story about how the person in charge of the Africat Foundation lured him to come over as part of a naturalist group. And his perspectives on the balance between, you know, eating and business and the economy and and wanting these beautiful animals to be alive in 100 years. So now we're getting into our rhinos. There are two kinds of rhino. There's a wide rhino, like really white rhino, and a Black rhino. Yeah, and we have some pictures of those that we got uh, better shots that we'll show you later. But this is the first time we actually spotted them. Now, are they protected or are they? Yes, absolutely. In fact, what, one of the things they do at the conservation areas is they cut the horn off the rhino every few years so that they don't get killed because people will poach just for the horn and then they kill the animal. So they keep the horn very, very short. And also, um, what they told us is that the penalty is death if you're caught poaching a rhino, a lion, any of those animals. Do they have a lot of poaching? No. Yes. So the, you can really see the difference between the rhinos in this picture. You see how flat? That's the white white rhino. And I don't remember that said white because I can't remember it. It's got a wide mouth. Whereas the black rhino's mouth comes to a point. <laughs> So just by listening, you can tell which is where. <coughs> when you're listening to the black rhino, you hear the sucking of the water through the thin, the point of the mouth. And you don't hear or see even a, a puddle or like a movement of the water when the black rhinos go in. Okay, thank you. So those pictures of the rhinos that you just saw that have that weird uh, tint to them, those are taken from a hide that we were in at one of the lodges. So you know, you go into the hide, there's a little opening and everybody's very quiet, there's no light, and you just sit there and you wait for the animals to come to the waterfall. You've seen that too, yeah, it's just incredible. And here are those babies I was telling you about. You see them running all around on the grass? Oh yeah. yeah. See the little tiny guys here? They're all, they're like all over. They're all over. They're so cute. Yeah, <laughs> See how fair it is, there's not enough plant life to support them all. 
Okay, these are really fabulous. These are birds are called social weavers, and they keep their nests from year to year, and they grow bigger and bigger. They add one piece of grass at a time. They're these little tiny birds. I think there's one more uh, picture of that. Bird right there, right here. Right, bringing one little strand of grass. Yeah, so you can see the nest there. They're unbelievable. Uh, they're just they're and they fly in from underneath. Huge. Huge. Yeah. Right, so they come with one little strand of grass and they put it in. Oh, so now we're moving in. Now we're moving into the time of the Himba people, and I'm just going to read this because I thought it really spoke to, um, spoke much better than I could, of course. Uh, the Himba, the Himba people inhabit Namibia's remote northwestern Kunin region. Basically, Herero is, in terms of origin, language, and culture, they are semi-nomadic uh, pastoralists who travel from one watering place to another. They seldom leave their home areas and continue to adhere to their tr cultural traditions. They are a tall, slender, slender, and statuesque people, characterized especially by their proud yet friendly bearing. The women especially are noted for their unusual sculptural beauty, enhanced by intricate hairstyles and traditional adornments. Um, a Himba woman spends as much as three hours a day on her appearance. First she bathes, then she anoints herself with her own individually prepared mixture, which not only protects her skin from the harsh desert sun, but also keeps insects away and prevents her hair from falling out. And then it goes on. It's interesting that this says bathes, because one of the things that we learned about the Himba women is that they never touch water to bathe for their entire lives. Um, the men can. What they do is they use this um, ochre, which is a mixture of a, um, they they it's a mixture of a, a red stone and goat fat, sorry goat milk fat, and. They put it all over their bodies, and they create a paste for their hair as well. And this is uh, what they put it in. It's made from a horn and uh, skin of an animal, and they keep it the mixture. They keep actually the fat in here, the animal fat, to mix with the ochre. And uh, I, I was able to get this from one of the women there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why don't they go in you know what they say? Tradition. Superstition. Tradition. Tradition. Yeah, but do you know where what the word out comes from? No, we couldn't really say. Yeah. It just had always been that way. Um, this is a little girl. But before they become have children, they wear their hair forward, and then you see, saw with all the other women, their hair was styled back. This was a special treat for us because this particular agency had a relationship, probably because one of their guides was a Himba. This is a, a tribe that, the only tribe that was able to get back their land and their native way of living in the, in the world country. So it wasn't that people came here to sightsee. We had a special present, really, from our agency that allowed trips up there you know, once a month or something like that. And it, we bring food up, um, treats, junk food. I was appalled, I was really upset by it. But 
you know, they brought a box of food as kind of an offering so that we, then we could come and, and see how they lived. I would, I would just say, we all, in addition to that, so we also, they also brought the huge things of rice and different grains. Oh yeah, that's stuff too. To <laughs> okay, so this is her hair. It looks like, um, the next there? there it is. So it's like a mud. So they never really. wash their hair. They never, I mean, really never touch water. It's just unbelievable. And they're beautiful looking. So this woman showed us how you put on the ochre. She had her baby in there and she had another son right behind her. Um, yeah, you can actually, there was ochre in those bells over there, so smell it. It's smelly. It's like goat fat. But they, they keep a fire burning all the time because multiple times a day they have to mix this stuff. And if in that previous one, she was actually mixing it on the rock and Jeanette said they gave us a demo. Here's the ochre and this is the ash from the fire. They heat it up, they rub it together and they apply it to their bodies. And the, the, one of the funny things was they said you could always tell when a man has had sex because he comes out covered in ochre. The hell is the smell? It just, it's, uh, oh, you mean in terms of body odor? No, no, mm -hmm. no body odor at all. We asked about that. We, well, we maybe you're right by him. So yep, yep. That kept away the bumps, you said? Yep. Yep, yeah, kept away the bumps. sunburn. And this is their home. Yeah. This is really their home. Um, it was, what, about maybe eight feet across? Do they have families? How did, what's their, what's their, you know, family structure or? Seem to be pretty traditional male, female children, but it also seemed like everyone took care of everybody's kids. Um, I mean, that was it. You know, there wasn't more than those people. So it was a very small group, a very small tribe. So the men mostly, you said, they were hurting, right? That's what they said, right? Yeah. I didn't see any goats, and I didn't see anybody doing any work. And the houses are <laughs> built with the, just uh, uh, sticks from trees, and it's covered with a mixture of mud and elephant dung. They make a paste, and that's it. And then at the end, they had some trinkets to sell. It's, you know, like a lot of places, there was really nothing to buy. Um, when we moved along, we started to see the industry, everywhere you go where it's poor, you probably have seen this, they have something that they have the people learning how to do, often some crafty thing. So in Namibia, it was um, beading, um, very intricately beaded sculptures and things. They, they didn't do that here. They just had wood carvings and anything they really came up with. Nothing was, that wasn't clearly their thing. Um, they were not looking to become part of the world. That was definitely true. Well, that was the box. Mm -hmm. What's there? Brain. Yeah, and meat. I mean, a lot of meat. Because they can't get vegetables and fruits. These guys only get what people bring them because there's nothing in the country. So, and that's expensive. So, fruits and vegetables weren't on most people's diet. Uh, you know, the funny thing with this box that you see here is the we stopped at to pick up supplies, and, as Jeanette said, to bring to them, and there was an empty box. And don't you know, the kids took the box and they got right in it. How many of us did that when we were little, right? It just, it's just, it's a universal thing, get inside the empty box, right? Yeah. That's a transition photo. <laughs> okay, now this is a real highlight for me, if you go back one. That's a meerkat, it's really hard to see. Did anybody here watch Meerkat Manor when it was on, on PBS? Well, it's the story of these meerkats that live in this incredible family structure. So that was our one and only meerkat, so I had to take a photo of it. And I don't think our guides had ever seen a meerkat either. It was pretty amazing. We were driving along and I was like, look, there's a bird What? What is that? What? Family structure. Oh, the family structure. It's uh, matri it's a matriarchal society. Mm -hmm. 
and um, only the, the, so they live in a family unit with a, a male and female that are bonded for life. They have lots of children. The daughters are not allowed to reproduce. Only the mother is. And if they want to, then they need to leave and go find a male from another group. So <coughs> she's talking about the mere cat. The mere right? cat. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> no, no. right. And, and if, a, if a, a female daughter gets pregnant, she will be ostracized and sent out and probably die mm -hmm. because without the protection of the family in the desert, you know, the freeze at night, they won't be able to get their own burrows, all that sort of stuff. Fascinating little creatures. Now, how cold was it at night? Did you guys say it was? Um, pretty chilly. I'd say 40. 40. Yeah. yeah. I mean, considering considering that it was like in the 70s during the day. And it was there dead of winter. Yeah. Remember? This is just to give you a sense of the landscape. Can I, can I ask you something? Well, do you know whether this land ever had trees or forests? Was, was the wood taken, or, or is it always like this? Not inland. Not inland where we are here, but we're going to show you another part that is completely underwater that's now desert. Desert? Mm -hmm. The skeleton coast, right? We're going to get to that hopefully. These are pie crows. I mean, everywhere you look, you see these dead trees that are just there. That's me dancing, right? I mean, you can see the palette, you know, the color palette is just beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so desert, these are desert adapted elephants. And this is the only place that they exist. Um, so I'm just going to read you something real quick. Uh, desert adapted elephants. Um, desert adapted elephant in the Namib walk further for water and fodder than any other elephant in Africa. The distances between water holes and feeding grounds can be as great as 43 miles. The typical home range of a family herd is 1,250 miles, or eight times as big as the ranges in Central Africa, where there's a lot more rainfall, so they don't have to go searching for water. They walk and feed at night and rest during the day. To meet their nutritional and bulk requirements, they browse on no fewer than 74 of the over 100 species that uh, grow there. So um, they're, not, uh, they're not a subspecies, they're, it's, they're their own thing. Uh, and they're amazing. We spent about two and a half hours one morning in our vehicles with the tops raised up just watching them. And Jeanette's got some great photos to show you. So there's another group called the Demara. It's a different tribe, and they also use ochre. So you can see they gave us a little ochre on our faces. So that was pretty interesting. Um, and they also live traditionally, but not nearly the way the Himba do. They're much more um, integrated. These are just some uh, pictures of that whole area, Demara land. Okay, before we talk about the Skeleton Coast, I just want to tell you one quick story about the Himba that Jeanette and I kind of planned this, but we didn't talk about this. The Himba people used to get lockjaw, right, uh, before they would, they would get tetanus shots and whatever. So what they would do in order to get liquid and things into the person who had lockjaw is they knocked out the bottom four teeth so that there was an opening. And they still do it. It became a tradition. We were talking about the water and women not being allowed to touch water. It became a tradition to knock out the bottom four teeth. So one of our guys, I think Jeanette mentioned some of the, one of our guys was Himba. They would leave for like maybe three or four or six weeks at a time, go work, and then go back to the tribe for a period of time. And we were talking to this one guy who was missing his bottom four teeth. They still do that when as soon as the second teeth come in, they knock them out because it's what they've always done, even though nobody gets locked off anymore. So, wow. so now, oh, this is the Skeleton Coast. 
you might have heard it's a very treacherous area along Africa um, during the trades, you know, the spice trades. Um, this is just a ship that's there. What they're doing there now, which is interesting, they're making um, it a oyster farm. Someone brought in oyster seeds and the conditions were right and turned it, now there's Namibian oysters. Um, we also went out on a plane trip. This is, there were stores in, in this, where were we? That was in Swakamond. Oh, Swakamond, right. So there was, a, there was a town. It had, you know, places that we could get some masks and some things and we went out on a <clears throat> whale watching tour because that's what you do, right? Where are you going? And this was an African pelican and a, a seal that came on board. You know, they were all trained. But the next one was a little uh, different. I was um, listening to a little talk and then all of a sudden, what comes flying? <laughs> An African pelican landed on my shoulder and stayed there for about 15 minutes during the whole talk. <laughs> And he was getting too heavy for my one shoulder, so I was like, all right, let me move one foot over to the other side and balance them. And he was like, no, no, no. No, I, I'm not really getting my feet moved by this chick and started getting that. He was very sweet, just wanted to move and flew up after that. <laughs> we did see whales, just like here. And now we're going up on our... our uh, That area? That was the Susuple. Oh, Susuple. The Susuple Desert. Oh, Namib Desert. So we took, uh, there was this optional thing that you could do, take a one hour flight on a five seater, including the pilot, so, or six seater. So we did that. It was unbelievable. There's some more of those that come up. Everybody's got their special signs. So these are the kinds of pictures that you usually see of Namibia, the Susu Blade. You get up at dawn and you see, you know, the shadows kind of created so one side looks black and one side is in the sun. Absolutely incredible. Even from the flight. Now this is a salt mine. Camel thorn trees. Good. Okay. I'm just kind of pick it up here. So there, there are these trees that are called camel thorn trees, and uh, that's that's what these are pictures of. They're dead. Um, so so you were asking before, Jordy, about water. So this whole area, 60,000 or so years ago, was completely underwater. And then uh, a river remained, and then ultimately the sand blocked the river, but all these remains of the trees are still there. And you can see the salt pans, which we've got some pictures of which are areas where the salt was deposited and then dried out. There's a big salt pan. That's called Deadvlei, D-E-A-D-V-L-E-I, which is one of the largest salt pans in Namibia. There are four really large ones. There's another picture of it. Also, I'm just going to show, these are the, uh, the seeds from the camel thorn tree. I mean, they're sort of very prehistoric, and the animals eat them. And I had already picked up a few before they told us not to touch them, so we started to you know, put them, so I thought I'd just show them. They're pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, correct. 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 It's all very musical there. It's a lot about music and singing. They had cell phones. They had cell phones. Yep. You can't get any reception. Right, because why would you get out there? Right, so you can't get any reception, but everybody's got a cell phone. So when you're, yeah, when you're in town, and, they, <laughs> and then they had walkie-talkies to communicate from yeah. deep to deep. Yeah. It was a lot more short wave, short wave radio still yeah. that they were working no, with. You can do that all the right. Guess what that is? I just want to say, part of the vacation though, they got you up way too early. Right. I don't know why those animals needed to get up so early. Four o'clock in the morning? So we had to go see yeah. them, something like that. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. It was ridiculous. Oh, no. <laughs> it's a vacation. Yeah. That's what you have to do. So that's why I look like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Oh, sun down there, we're feeling better. <laughs> Other end. And they brought chairs and food, it was just lovely. And there we are, we still are together at the end of the vacation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, and this is just uh, a little quick lesson on the click language. everything they want to communicate by clicking? Yes, they have a click language. There is a click language where they communicate everything. And it's a, it's a, the words, their words as well as clicks that go along with it. So it's easy to click, I could do that. But once I started to add language to it, I could do it. Like if you want to, like you want to say hello, it might be a little or something, yeah. something weird like that. But what I wanted to say is we visited this school and the kids are sent away to school because they live so far. They go there for several months and then they go home. But they've got a room with bunk beds with what, I don't know, 20 more kids sleeping in it. And the kids have barely any possessions. And they've got a whole group of people who wash the clothes and it's hanging all over the fences. And so when we were there, I think Jeanette was the one who asked them what, what do they need, and they, they needed a washing machine. So we all chipped in, and the tour, we gave the money to the tour company to buy the school a washing machine, which I, it took a while, but they finally got it. But I mean, it's really basic, but they don't complain, they just live their lives, you know, as, as they are. Yeah. So what percentage of the population of this country is educated or has schooling at all? I think it's pretty small. Yeah. What percentage what? It's, it's a very small percentage because they don't have public education. If you can afford to send your kid there, you go. Otherwise, you can't go to public school. And it might be like $80 a year to send your kid to school. But they don't have $80. Right. Don't have, they don't have $80, right. Right, absolutely. When you're saying push needs Push Push So it's running water, electricity. Yeah, we have we had everything. Yeah, in our hut we had um, shower, bathroom, light, a tea service. When you're driving through, yeah. Are you seeing electricity and lights and everything? No. A lot of it's coming from solar. That's mostly what's heating the water. Some places they burn wood under your water container and so certain parts of the day you did um generators generators get their water um they had wells so why don't they farm with wells they have not enough water not enough water it's very hard to get it and there's not much well water it looked like most people went and got their water commercially like you know bought water they're poor. They have no industry. All they have is, you know, that farming that goes on, you know, and that industrial. No, we didn't have a drink of water. But it's a developing country. It really is a But I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't take any precautions around food, as I probably wouldn't, because you already know who I am, right? Eating everything that I can see. I ate lettuce, tomatoes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I ate uh, fruits, you know, pretty much push the limit. Do they tell you not to? 
Probably. They said Absolutely. to be careful. They always tell you not to. But I think most of us ate vegetables and fruit. That was all imported. Yeah. South Africa, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's water. Water. Could, you, could you eat, would there be enough to eat there if you didn't eat uh, animal products? Mm. Could you make it? You brought a bunch of your own food. Oh no, we have vegetarians at the table. We did. We did. I think but they brought to, shrimp and things. But I think it would be hard to be vegan, vegan. there. I don't think it would be hard to be vegetarian. Yeah. I mean, being vegan would have its challenges. But it's good. They accommodate you. Like if you needed a refrigeration for medicine or something, they take care of that if you're vegetarian. If you told your group you were vegan and explained to them what that means, I bet they'd meet you there and make it for you. They're really accommodating. So I think the time is up, right? Any last questions? Okay, I mean, we had a great trip. We actually had a week on and we went to South Africa as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Totally different. Totally different. Thank you very much. Thank you.